Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by Plein Air Magazine for people who love painting outdoors. PlenAirMagazine.com And by Masterpiece Canvas Makers of fine art canvases We supply the canvas You supply the vision And by PaintingFromNature.com a website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. Paintingfromnature.com In 1852, a group of California pioneers stumbled upon a grove of trees that were gigantic. The 2,000-year-old botanical giants measured 25 to 30 feet in diameter and held as much potential lumber as one full acre of typical pine forests. Immediately, work began to cut the largest tree in the grove. Following 22 days of constant cutting, the tree finally fell to the ground, splintering into mostly unusable pieces. After 40 years and constant attempts to plunder the potential wealth of these great trees, the milling attempts were halted. For what the lumberjacks failed to realize was that the trees were brittle and not suited for the construction industry. In that short span of four decades, 8,000 giant trees were cut, and a cumulative ecological lifespan of 1.6 million years lay in waste on the forest floor. I'm Stefan Bauman, and welcome to the Grand View. When this place was first discovered, people couldn't believe that trees like this could exist. It wasn't until artists like Albert Bierstadt came into the wilderness and captured this place on canvas that people began to believe the myth. Today, people venture into the wilderness to see for themselves this magical place. So come along with me as I journey among giants, Sequoia National Park. This summer we've had 14 bears hit by cars, which is just an unbelievable tragedy. Of the 14 bears that have been hit so far, uh, we have confirmed that four of them have been killed and several others injured. Bears heal pretty well, but I mean, this, these are pretty hard impact injuries. Um, one bear that was hit by a car ran off into the woods and, and died soon afterward. And when some of my employees found it, they found it was nursing and a cub was up nursing with it that had been, appeared to have been killed by other bears in the area. So you have another casualty along with the bears that were killed. Um, this particular bear was 19 years old. She was first caught by us in 1984. And at that time we were still giving bears names. Her name was Belle. And um, so basically we had a 19 year old bear that had been wild, living free, just killed by someone speeding in the park and her cub, as a result, was also killed. People do some fairly unusual things here, and we'd like to try to stress safety, um, but we do occasionally have people take their food, try to take food back from a bear, um, try to pet a bear. Part of it is from TV commercials. They'll see in a TV, there's a TV commercial right now where people fight off a bear, 
And um, lately we've had people try to fight a bear off their food too, and, and that's not a good idea. Once a bear has your food, the bear has the food. The idea is to never let the bear get the food in the first place. But yeah, occasionally we'll have people encourage their children to go up and pet a bear. Um, we actually had someone feed a bear a cookie about two weeks ago, which shocks, it, it shouldn't shock me, but I always think that we've gotten rid of that um, type of behavior. It's, it's awful. I mean, that, that one, that one moment could change that bear's life forever. That one bad choice that one person made. Well, here at Sequoia and Kings Canyon, we have a partner organization called the Sequoia Natural History Association. And the History Association does a lot for us. They do education seminars, they raise money for us, and they support us, and, and we work with them as colleagues. And one thing that they came up with this year is, a Save, is the Save the Bear kit. And it's actually something they're selling at the visitor centers with a pin and um, a word search and a little bit of education about bears. And the reason it really helps us is, A, it gets the word out, it gets the message out. We must all work together to save these bears. And secondly, um, a lot of the proceeds go to bear management because we don't have um, a funded program right now. But what they've decided is they're going to they're gonna have this source of funding and whatever they raise from that, we can use. And even if you know, they only raise a few thousand dollars. That could be an internship for the summer. At first glance, fire seems devastating. But it's actually important to the regrowth of the sequoia forest. Within the last 3,000 years, the biggest effect on giant sequoia populations has come from fire exclusion. And so for the last century, in areas where fire has been excluded, there has just been no sequoia reproduction. And if you look back in time, no other century is comparable. Every century of the past has had some sequoia reproduction going on, except this century. You know, as we know, Native Americans lived amongst the sequoias for thousands of years, and they were intimate with the sequoias. But it wasn't until 1852 that the world at large learned about giant sequoias. That was their effective discovery by the rest of the world besides the Native Americans. And it was within a year of that that the first sequoia got cut down. And it was the largest giant sequoia they could find that they cut down. And fortunately, it wasn't the largest alive. They hadn't discovered most of the other sequoia groves. But this was in the mining districts, and they didn't have saws large enough to deal with giant sequoias. And so they used pump augers. And it took five men 22 days of pump augering. They just kept drilling hole after hole after hole through the sequoia, and then went around to the other angle and drilled more holes, more holes, more holes. And 22 days later, they were driving wedges into it and had taken a break to go have lunch. And a gust of wind came up while they were having lunch, and the tree came crashing down. Uh, an ironic side of the logging of giant sequoias. By the time logging came to an end, maybe one fourth of all sequoia area had been cut. The great irony is that just about everyone who tried to make a living off of logging sequoias went broke in the end. And part of the reason they went broke is that these great masses of wood weren't of high quality. They would fall a sequoia, and when it hit the ground, it would usually shatter. You know, very brittle wood, not good for structural purposes. And if it didn't shatter, it was too big to move, so they would drill a hole and stuff gunpowder inside of it and explode the gunpowder to split the wood into little pieces. And a lot of people have estimated about half of the wood was completely wasted, just left on site as small fragments. And the other half eventually went to the mills, but it wasn't good timber for construction. And it ended up going to more ignominious uses like fence posts and grape stakes. I'm very thankful that I lived in my time, that I lived here, 
with the people that I knew, all the old people. Because I am Indian, I'm all Indian, I believe in Indian people and their ways and the fact that we are the Aboriginal people of this land and beyond uh, documentation. And I say, you know, if you go out here and see these ark sites or the artifacts you find, and if you understand uh, nature and the change and the people that came through, and uh, you look at the different places where they lived, and you know good and well that not one family lived there, not two or three, but there were hundreds of families that came through here back in the 30s. And you know, when I was born in 39 and uh, into the 40s, uh, there was a lot of trapping going on in this country, and we'd go and after school in the evening, we'd have to make the run to collect anything. Back then, they would buy furs, and you could send them through the mail. And uh, just about anything would bring, uh, like a skunk, maybe bring you 25 cents or something like that. Uh, you know, a wildcat or a bobcat would bring you, you know, 5 to $10 or something in that area. But back then, money was worth something, you know, and so it was a way to make a living, keep you fed. When there was a problem within the community, it was mostly settled by the women. The old ladies, I'd, you'd see them, they'd be going across the field to the trail or somewhere, and they may stay all day at someone's house talking these things over, and somewhere during that day it was settled and they'd just get up and go home. Nothing else was ever said about it. You live in your own time, you live in the way that your people and the, the times dictate. I am very thankful that I lived in my time, that I lived here with the people that I knew, all the old people. And the changes that we see today in the young people, I think is going to be another time. I believe in my people, the Indian people, and I believe in myself. amongst the giants today and I have to say I'm so anxious to get started this area is so beautiful not only because of the thick forest but we've discovered a beautiful place where these yellow flowers are blooming so without further ado I want to go ahead and get started I'm gonna take my ultramarine blue and burnt sienna and these are gonna be my two sketching colors I'm gonna add a little bit of turpentine to these two colors and mix them together and I'm very quickly just going to lay the basin for these trees. This is going to be a little bit different than some of the paintings that we've done. This particular painting is going to consist more foreground, very little sky. So most of our lines are going to go up through the top of the canvas. So indicate the trees just by some very bold brush strokes. I'm going to break the canvas up into th uh, thirds here. And this will be the darker area of my distant trees. Now, the forest gets dark in the distance, so we're going to indicate that by adding a little bit more blue back here. When you're looking at something so vertical, the first tendency is to just paint them in just with vertical lines. But these trees are actually very ancient and very intricate. They've been affected by fire and wind and all types of things that have affected this forest over periods of thousands of years. So they have knotted bases and they have these wonderful deep, deep gouges from fires. So you want to spend some time really looking at the subject matter. This is one of the great things about painting outdoors is that you really focus in on the details. I have to say that I love painting in meadows because of all the sound effects that you get in the background. It seems like I've already made a little friend. He's a giggling in the background. Spend some time drawing and really studying these trees. Pretend you're a botanist and that you're paying attention to what makes these trees live. By standing someplace for a long time, you really get a sense that these trees, they have a soul to them. And if you can tune into that and bring it into your painting, you're going to get a quality that you can't get from a photograph. And painting outdoors you get that sense of being connected with nature.
Now, my meadow in here is fairly flat from what I see. I do see an indication of a separation between the meadow and the flowers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little bit more emphasis on the line so that this line will help bring the viewer back into the back part of my picture. Creating a little bit more energy coming to this tree, back to this tree, and then we'll probably zigzag something back up into this tree. That way the viewer bounces between these two trees. This main focal area in here, it's going to be the flowers. And because of the color of these flowers in contrast to all the red and the green, this is really what the viewer is going to see from across the room and want to walk across the gallery to see your painting. We also have to have a little sensitivity for composition. And composition is not complicated. It's actually a very simple process of just being aware of the direction of the eye. Now, we normally look at a picture from left to right. That's just the way that we read and that's the way that we usually look at things. So what happens is that the left side of the picture is left fairly simple. The right side of the picture is going to be more complex. That's the reason why I placed this tree here. Now, the meadow here has been trampled down by a deer. And so there's a little feeling of, a, of grass that's fallen over and it's creating some shadow. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a little diagonal line that meets up with this line. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in another tree, a little closer in. I'm going to have this in shadow, but I just feel it's a little empty in this space, so I'm going to put in another, another sequoia here. But I don't want a lot of attention into this, so this whole tree here will be in shadow. Remember the main focal point's in the center. Nature becomes very curious to know what you're doing as you're out here. And before you know it, deers come out birds look over your shoulder. Okay, we're just about ready to start our painting. So far we've just used the burnt sienna and cobalt blue for our sketch and I've alternated between the shadows where I use more blue and more burnt sienna where the highlights are going to hit. Now these trees appear lighter than the background trees so by squinting my eyes I can actually see areas of shadow. Now the light is starting to peak over the trees. So we're going to get ready by adding a little bit of white to our palette. I also want to add a little bit of cad yellow medium to our palette. Now I'm going to squint my eyes and I'm going to pay attention to the color of the sky. The sky is not blue. It's early morning and I have to actually look up into the sky to see what color it is. And we just want to put in little indications of sky peeking through these magnificent sequoias. If you squint your eyes, you can see these little dashes of light. Don't cover all your background color. These dark colors are very important to create mystery in your painting. And I'm being very, very cautious to stay between my drawing. Just painting the background light on the background trees. And now there's a little flood of light peeking through that's a little brighter. And it's coming in at an angle. So I'm going to indicate that also. As the sun comes out, you start painting these effects that are happening. You can see the sun's coming right through. Now as the sun comes out, the lighting is going to be very crucial at this moment. I'm going to actually wipe off some of my sketch to try to get the highlights on. Just follow the contour of the tree and wipe off with just turpentine at the tip of your brush. Now we're in the forest so the light's going to be constantly changing very fast. You'll be amazed that when you're standing in one place and you're looking over a meadow, the light will almost feel like somebody's with a spotlight 
highlight in one section and then it gets dark. Another section it gets dark. And that's the light as it changes over the canopy of trees and all these shadows fall in different places. Pay attention to this. When you see something you like, jot it down. I call those footnotes. They remind me later on where the light was. So when you see something interesting, throw a little footnote in, remind you. Now what we're gonna do is start working on our flowers here. Before we put our flowers in, we do have to put the stalks in first and the leaves that are growing off of the stalks. And what I'm doing is I'm mixing Viridian Green with a little bit of white and I just lay little highlights. Now, we actually have the base of the stalks in in our shadow. And if we squint our eyes, we only see just the light laying on top of the shadow. So we're not going to worry about painting within this grouping of flowers here, the shadow area. Now remember, as the meadow comes closer, everything gets larger. And it's important to remember, if you want to create depth, that your brush strokes have to be larger in the foreground. So as this grouping of flowers comes at me, I'm going to make sure that the leaves are larger. Now since I have this wonderful color on my brush, I'm going to add a little bit more yellow to it, make it a little bit brighter, and I'm going to start painting some of the grass. Now I'm going to rub off my brush so there's not a lot of paint on it. I'm going to hold it this way, and I'm going to act like I'm brushing my teeth. I'm going to do little short strokes up and down, and I'm just going to indicate some feeling of, of grass. Now, I don't want a lot of detail in this grass. I'm just going to pull up, pull down, and scrub back and forth just to give an indication. And I'm mixing this greenish tone right into my dark tone. I don't want to have a lot of dark in this area, but I also don't want to have a lot of light. While I have this color on my brush, I'm going to put a little thicker variation of that same tone, and I'm going to put the leaves on my foreground flowers. I don't know if you've noticed, I've pretty much painted this entire painting with this brush. And we're going to switch to a smaller brush and start working some of the details on the flowers. Very carefully put your stems in. And you can see it connects all of these leaves together. And just like that, you've got these taller flowers in the foreground. We're at the point we've been waiting for, and that's to put the flowers in. I'm going to take yellow with a little bit of red and mix a shadow color for my flowers. And then with a little brush, very carefully start putting the foreground detail on our flowers first. A little bit of yellow. Just start indicating the little flowers. The foreground ones are very important to keep detailed. Little strokes. Now with the detail done in the foreground flowers, we're going to start putting the detail in the background flowers. These ones back here will indicate with just little dots. Now we're going to put the centers into these flowers. We're going to mix blue and burnt sienna together to make a nice dark color. And now for the conclusion of every painting, the signing. Expanded instructional DVDs that feature an hour-long demonstration of today's painting and other paintings in the series are available at The Grand View by calling 1-800-511-1337. Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, along with a free diagram of today's subject.
Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by PaintingFromNature.com A website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. PaintingFromNature.com And by Masterpiece Canvas Makers of fine art canvases We supply the canvas You supply the vision And by Plein Air Magazine For people who love painting outdoors Plein Air Magazine dot com.